Good afternoon, everyone. Today on the final bar, we're going to talk market follow through, potentially nice sort of rally going into the close with the S&P testing that key 2800 level broke through 2750, pushing higher, not quite closing above 2800, but breaking it intraday. So the question on everyone's mind, are we at the end of a bear market rally? Or are we at the initial up thrust of further recovery? Uh, we're going to look at a number of technical uh, reasons to try to unpack those themes. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Dave Keller, Chief Market Strategist at StockCharts.com, and welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. We're with you every weekday after the close, so thanks for joining us to uh, look at today's technical trends, technical movements, unpack today's trading uh, using the charts, and then connect the short term of today with the longer term perspective. And again, I, you know, I've had so many debates with peers of mine in the industries, fellow, fellow technical analysts talking about you know, bear market rallies. And, and again, you know, most of us have been through a couple of these and, uh, and boy, they, they seem so much easier in the rear view mirror, but in the heat of it, it is very hard to differentiate a bottom from a short term bounce to differentiate a dead cat bounce from a, you know, a V bottom. And so we're going to hopefully look at some of the charts and indicators that can help us try to answer those questions more effectively. But today, what I think you'll find is a sector rotation is actually kind of compelling with financials leading the way based on uh, news from the Fed and uh, elsewhere. So we'll get to all of that, including a great guest, John Kosar. But first, I just want to point out some of the events we have coming up on this show and on Stock Charts TV over the next week. We are going to take tomorrow off uh, for, uh, for the three-day weekend. So hope you have a great, uh, wonderful weekend. And we'll see you again back on Monday, the uh, 13th. Uh, on Monday, on our uh, sister show, Behind the Charts, which is more of an interview-style show, we'll feature a conversation with Rick Bensinger from In the Know Trader. Uh, then on the 14th on Tuesday, we have Brian Shannon from Alpha Trends joining us on this show. And then on the 15th and 16th, we have a very special uh, two-part series to share with you called The Big Board, uh, Behind the Scenes at the New York Stock Exchange. We spent a fantastic day with Jay Woods, one of the executive floor governors on the floor of the exchange just before the uh, Christmas holiday, the end of last year. And we've uh, produced some really good uh, takeaways from that, sharing some of our conversations about the history of the building, the exchange, the uh, you know, method that they're trading, the role of the market maker and how that's evolved. So you're not going to want to miss a window behind the scenes into the operation of the big board coming up next week on the 15th and 16th. Getting to today's market recap, uh, you know, so, so today, you know, yesterday we sort of had this nice sort of a rally that sort of continued on and on. We finished in a position of strength right at that 2750 level, which we've talked about for a while as being a key uh, resistance level, sort of that 2700 to 2750 range. We sort of blown right through that. And as you can see, looking at the daily chart, and we're just going to update it for today's close, you can see we really were sitting on there yesterday and the day before, right at 2750. That's a Fibonacci level coming from the 2018 to 2020 uh, uptrend. You can see uh, today, you know, it's all about follow through. And I feel like we sort of got that. We sort of got that follow through to the upside. Uh, with, uh, you know, with, uh, with the market continuing to make higher highs and higher lows. And as we've talked about on this tactical time frame, I think as long as the market continues to make higher highs and higher lows, uh, you know, that's sort of, uh, you know, that's the most important short-term trend to uh, pay attention to. Now, as we get to sort of the, what I would argue, the later stages of a bear market rally, it's starting to look at indicators and ways to try to understand how far we might want to go. And when we start breaking through resistance levels, I'm looking down at the RSI, I'm seeing it near the 60 point, which generally speaking in a broad bear market phase, you would see um, the RSI come up to 60 and that's about it. Usually doesn't go much further than that. So I think we're sort of entering the point where you might expect that to, uh, to come into play. Um, uh, below after that, you're sort of looking at previous times when the market's uh, peaked out to the next sort of short-term resistance around 2870. That comes from a number of different places going back over the last uh, six months or so. So we're sort of nearing some of those uh, levels. But, you know, again, credit to the, to the short-term strength. We continue to uh, sort of push forward and have higher highs and higher lows. 
the real test is going to be on any pullback, right? And, and as we've talked before, as we just jumped out of the lows, the question was, can we stay above 2450? I think you need to bump that up now and see whether we're able to break, you know, remain above the most recent swing low on any pullback. And until that happens, the short term, that tactical trend remains higher. We're sort of combining today our market recap with wrapping the week just because we're on a, on, a, on a long weekend coming up Thursday. So I want to rotate now to just look at some of the longer term charts and see how that short term trend picks in, uh, fits into the bigger picture. So this is more of the long term trend that I tend to look at. And again, it's very long term. So this is looking at a weekly chart of the S&P, the 21 and 34 week exponential moving averages, and then a shorter term, sort of the, uh, the medium term time frame here at the bottom, which is a weekly PPO or what you might call a weekly MACD looking at those time frame. So what happened is as the market sold off so aggressively going down so quickly in such a, a short amount of time, it took some time for these trend following devices to really catch up on it. The uh, sort of that medium term time frame turned negative mid February for uh, by my read using again, the weekly PPO that still remains uh, relatively negative. So on the tactical, the very short term, you, you know that we've uh, been in rally mode. But on this intermediate term, it's still telling you, obviously, we're, we're in a downtrend. And, and this is by design. These are not meant to trigger very quickly. It's meant to minimize whipsaws. So it would have to take a little more time. There's a time factor in there before it's going to be able to trigger any sort of buy signal. It's telling you to still be cautious. And the very long-term time frame, sort of the, you know, the, the ultra long-term, the secular time frame, by my, by my read, still uh, suggesting we're in a position of weakness. And, and again, I think that's overall how the market kind of feels. Uh, by, by any measures I've really looked at, we feel like we're in bear market rally mode, uh, not a new uptrend by my, by my read on breadth and otherwise. Those models are meant to try to put a little more rigor behind that anecdotal measurement of where, uh, of where we think we, uh, we're at. This is uh, the other daily chart that, I've, uh, that I uh, keep a look at. And again, we're sort of entering that next resistance level, which lines up with support from last August, last October. So previously, that 27 to 2750 range lined up with last summer, March and June. Now we're in the range 20, uh, you know, 20 to 2860 or so. It's sort of the support levels from last, uh, going into last fall, actually, end of last summer into uh, last fall. That's actually, actually the big uh, initial sell-off we had coming off of the highs in mid-February. We pulled back right around 16%. Uh, to this low around 28.55. And so again, that's why we're entering this next sort of resistance range. So again, if, you know, if uh, in, a, in a plain vanilla market, if we've now had enough of a bear market rally, we're nearing that point with the RSI with the resistance that would be about where this thing should end. So I think the question myself and many others are asking is, uh, is whether or not we're going to get that capitulation to this bear market rally. Now, the breadth picture has actually improved in some ways. We're going to look at a second of the percent of stocks breaking above the 200-day and the 50-day, which I think has improved. Um, but also this one, we've looked at this as a cumulative advanced decline lens. And what I've told you is until we see some improvement here, until we see a reversal from the downtrend in these cumulative advanced decline lines, then the trend is still, you know, there's still this inherent weakness, internal weakness to the market. But if you look at what's happened now, we have now established a higher low, which was the low we had in the last uh, couple of days. We've now, based on uh, yesterday into today, and these have not updated yet for today's close, this is just through yesterday, we've established a higher high uh, with both of these, with the S&P, with the NYSE, with also the mid cap index, and now with the small cap index, they've all established higher lows and higher highs in the cumulative advanced decline line. That just sort of confirms we're in uh, in rally mode, right, on that on that tactical time frame. It's sort of pretty encouraging if you're more you know, trying to look for a bottom uh, being in place. And again, I think number one is price. As long as we keep making higher highs and higher lows, um, you know, the, 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 the path of least resistance is higher. This is an interesting one. And I've, I've mentioned this chart a number of times, and I just tweeted out a, a little bit ago, um, this particular chart and some comments on it. You know, there are two uh, sort of examples of, of what I've seen takeaways from this. When we first initially became bombed out, and this indicator is the percent of stocks in the S&P above their 200-day. When it really got below 10%, I'm immediately looking back at some of these previous bull market lows, right? So the low December 2018, the low mid-2011. Um, we didn't quite get down there. We only got to 20% here in 2015, 16. But you can see these levels where it gets relatively low, and that ends up being the short-term bottom within this overall bear market, or, sorry, excuse me, bull market phase here. Um, once we broke below there and started to sit down here, and I've zoomed uh, out a little bit, but we've spent you know a month there with 
you know, pretty close to zero, less than 10% of stocks above their 200 day, that immediately to me sort of un disconnects it from these short term pullback readings. And it looks a lot more like the 2008 to 2009 readings where it went below 10%, remained below 10% for six plus months before it finally got back above 10%. And my, my hunch was, boy, it's starting to look a lot more like that, where it's more of an extended bear market that tends to take a lot more time. Breath can remain depressed. I think that's what we're seeing. What's happened though, is with the severity of the sell-off and now the severity of the bear market rally, all of a sudden it doesn't look a lot like this 2008 to 2009 period anymore. That I think is really uh, compelling. I think what's interesting now is it doesn't look like any of these periods. It's not lining up with the short-term uh, you know, bull market pullback phase because it wasn't a quick one and done and it got really low. It's no longer like this 2008, 2009 period because that remained really muted for six months plus. This has remained muted for about a month and all of a sudden it started to pop up again. And so, you know, sadly, I think it is truly sort of uncharted territory in terms of how this looks from a breadth perspective. I think we've run out of recent examples to really compare this to, which, which is fine. I think we have to fall back to the traditional toolkit, but I think a lot of people are looking for analogs. And I think what this is telling me from a breadth perspective, it's not looking like the short-term pullbacks and it's not looking like the previous bear market, market cycles either. I think we're in a new type of environment. I think we're a new type of, uh, of bear market rally here. The final thing I want to I want to get to, and then we're gonna we're gonna move on to our next segment, is just looking at um, the bull bear spread. This is the AAII rankings. I think it's interesting to note that in the last couple of weeks, the spread between bulls and bears has come off a little bit. It was very bearish, uh, with over twenty percent more bears than bulls, and we had over fifty percent of respondents saying they were bearish. That's come off a little bit. It's still forty five percent of respondents saying they're bearish, but there have been more and more bulls every week. They're getting closer and closer to an even pitch between the two. So even with this bull market, this, uh, this sort of bull market within a bear, this rally that has been so sudden and so surprising to many, including me, um, is the fact that you still have more bears than bulls, but not completely switching gears. It's not like everyone's turned bullish again and that there's uh, you know, a, a euphoria for stocks on the long side. I think there's still overall a, a skepticism, a pessimism with almost, you know, with 45% of respondents still bearish. It has not dramatically uh, changed from there. It sounds like it would take more, uh, more movement to see people uh, reverse their opinion. Again, with these, I, I bucket something like the AAII survey is more anecdotal. For me, it's all about the trend. It's all about the charts and it's about what the, the charts are showing, what, what the movements are, uh, are happening in terms of the highs and the lows. And again, by any measure in the short term, the, the path of least resistance, I think, remains positive until proven differently. So you want to look for lower high, lower low. And I think we've got a lot of pullback before that would confirm short term weakness uh, of read from a, from a trend following perspective. That's our wrap for the week. And boy, I feel like when we're, well, there's so many things to do. I just want to finish with one more comment and then we're going to go to our next segment called Level Up. I did want to point out just very quickly the sectors because I think as much as today was a bit of an upside follow through, it was noteworthy that for most of the day, the leading sectors were real estate and utilities, the XLRE and the XLU. So I, I was looking earlier midday, it was like, wow, the market again making new swing highs here. But it's the real defensive stuff that was leading it. Financials emerged during the day and became the number one sector up over 5% today, which is encouraging. I and mean, obviously that's based on you know, the Fed, Fed news and, uh, and further support for the market should be uh, good for, uh, for some financial stocks. And I, if you look at the chart of the XLF, it's actually started to resolve higher. Some of these stocks like JP Morgan and others that I was sort of saying are in consolidation mode have, uh, have moved up a little bit. But when I'm looking at, you know, looking at this, I'm seeing defensives lead, but Financials emerging number one, they have not been anywhere near the top of the list for a while. So that's an interesting sector theme going into the long weekend. Also, number one from the bottom was technology. And we think about the leadership in tech and how resilient that's been. We start to see days where tech is at the lower end of the, uh, of the return list. And we start to question some of the, uh, the upside here. So again, as much as it should, I feel like it, I want it to be a everything's great. We're in the clear going positive. I'm seeing sector rotation that feels still a little more defensive than everything's great. And we're sort of betting on the long side. I feel like there's accumulation, but still more on the defensive side, still uh, planning on more backing and filling. Our next segment, folks, is called uh, Level Up. And the idea with this segment is to upgrade our use of technical analysis to improve what we're doing. And I have a slide to share with you. I wanted to talk with you about different uh, timeframes. 
Um, you know, I've had some questions. I, I love to throw around phrases like short term and the medium term and the long term and the tactical and the secular. And forgive me for not taking the time sometimes to clarify what is meant by some of those time frames. And, and I will tell you that, you know, knowing, you know, others in the industry, it is very subjective, right? So for me, long term means a bunch of years. For you, long term might be a couple of weeks, right? And, and so it's all relative. So you have to think of those terms in terms of your own process. What I want to do with the next couple of minutes is just share with you how I think of these time frames, short term, medium term, long term, what they mean to me, and, so, and then sort of how I think about them, what, what the data supports. And then also, you'll notice at the bottom, just very quickly, how your use of technical analysis should relate to your use of fundamental analysis, for example. So for me, I think of things in short in, in three phases. The short term for me is a couple days to a couple weeks. And, and I, as you may have guessed from how I describe charts and how I describe things, I am not an engineer. I am not a detail person. I'm actually much more of a big picture thinker. So I love thinking about themes. I've always been attracted more to the psychology and the sentiment and the behavior of the markets and less the statistical analysis of the markets. But I like marrying the two. I like using quantitative methods that help me quantify what I think people are thinking and seeing. So for me, short term is a couple days to a couple weeks. For some of you, short term might be intraday and that is totally fine. I don't tend to think that short term. That's a little much for me. I, I tend to think in this time frame. In the medium term, which is I would argue the sweet spot for technical analysis is a couple months to a couple years. And that six to 12 month time frame. if you look at a trend following um, uh, analysis, anyone that tries to find the optimal moment, that optimal time frame for trend following, it usually ends up coming up around six to 12 months. And then long term for me is sort of multiple, uh, multiple years. Now, how to think about each of these time frames? Short term, if you look at a couple days to a couple weeks and you look at a ton of data, uh, data looking at equities over multiple decades, multiple cycles, in general, looking at that time frame, the data supports mean reversion. Meaning, in general, if you're trying to make money in that short term time frame, you're better off buying weakness and selling strength. And that's based on you know the short term fluctuations in the market. We tend to overshoot and undershoot um, you know uh, valuations, and as a result, the short term markets tend to mean revert. In the medium term, if you're looking a couple months to a couple years, you should be a trend follower if you're an equity investor, all else being equal in a vacuum, because that's where the data tends to work. So if you think about it, any academic work that I've seen on momentum, on trend following, on relative strength, all supports that six to 12 month time frame. So any of you that have worked with institutional investors and have seen a quantitative model trying to generate returns, they usually combine these two and they'll do 12 month returns minus one month returns call it 12 minus one, and that's a common momentum factor for institutions because they want to find stocks that have a strong year and a weak short term or weak month, sort of a pullback within a longer term uptrend. If you go further than a year or two out, in general, markets tend to mean revert again because now you have the business cycle and you have themes and sectors and, and trades coming in and out of favor over that very long term. So for me, when I say short term, I'm talking about a couple days to a couple weeks, and I have a, a, a keen eye for mean reversion, which is why as the market has rallied, in the short term, I'm always looking for where we find a bounce lower, and that's why I'm looking at support resistance levels right now in the S&P. On the medium term, a couple months to a couple years, it's trend following, and that's why I have trend following models that help me try to capture that time frame. And I don't think technical analysis is incredibly valuable as a trading platform for beyond a couple years. I do think it's very helpful to illustrate the data and to understand the evolution of themes and approaches. And so I still think charts are very valuable. I just think it's less of a technical uh, question. It's more of a visualization question. That is my quick four minute primer on timeframes. I hope this was helpful. I'll probably turn that into a blog post and send it around uh, if you're interested in digging into that a little deeper. We need to take a quick commercial break. Back with my guest, John Kosar from Asbury Research. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I'm Dave Keller, your host here at StockCharts.com. We'd love to answer your questions in a future Final Bar mailbag segment. So come, uh, keep them coming. Just hit us via email. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com is the best way to get a hold of us. You can also look us up on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV. We'd be happy to uh, get some of your questions there. Just tag us in a post and we'll uh, capture all of those 
Early next week, we'll do another mailbag segment. We'd love to answer your questions about the markets, technical analysis, and elsewhere. To help us try to make sense of this bear market rally environment, we have a fantastic analyst today, John Kosar from Asbury Research. John, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Good to have you back. And uh, also a pleasure to see you contributing uh, more and more to stockcharts.com. I've seen some of your articles come through and I hope everyone is checking out what you're writing. So it's really, really valuable content. You said two charts ahead of time. The first one was looking at where the S&P is relative to its 200 day moving average. What is this telling you about the current situation? Well, I think it's interesting because you actually talked about this. I thought it was a really smart comment you made is that within the context of the uptrend, the S&P 500 has been making lows around 10 to 12 percent underneath the 200-day moving average, and then there's a bottom, and then the market goes higher. Uh, the S&P 500 goes higher. Well, this time, um, it went underneath there, which meant the character of the market changed. It was no longer in a bull market. That was a very good kind of subtle evidence that um, you know, the landscape changed. But this chart shows that back on March the 20th, uh, the S&P moved 18% underneath its 200-day. And if you go back across the chart, you'll see that happened in November of 2008, which wasn't the final bottom, but that was the primary bottom, let's call it. And then there was a lower bottom, I believe, in March of 2009. Then if you go back even further to July of 2002, you can see that was the start of the bottoming process. So this is... This tells you that you're in the neighborhood, but you're really not in the driveway yet. But this tells you we have to go back 100 years to find a pandemic. Uh, and I don't think, you know, most people weren't around back then, certainly. But fear and greed is the constant. Um, it transcends time. Um, people generally react to fear and greed the same way. So this tells you from a fear standpoint, this is about as low as we've been, certainly since at least uh, the year 2000. And if we took this chart back, I'm sure you'd see other instances of that as well. That's so helpful. And, and I think you hit on such a fantastic point. I think a lot of people have struggled to find a historical parallel to this, but you're right. It's, there are plenty of reasons why people have been afraid and been euphoric or desperate. And I think that's what you're, illustrating here, which is beautifully done. Um, chart number two, you're actually looking at the rate of change about how the S&P has evolved now in the short term. How does that relate to your first chart? Well, I wanted to keep the um, indicator the same, so to speak. They're both indicators that indicate price momentum. The first one, obviously, very long term, um, you know, going back 20 years. This one, very short term. Our, you, you had talked about time frames. At Asbury Research, our tactical time frame is one month or 21 business days. So this, has, so this happens to be a 21 day or a monthly rate of change, MROC, we call it, down at the bottom. And you can see that um, we fell underneath the um, zero line on February the 24th. Uh, which was just, that was the big gap day. That was the money we came in and the market had gapped down on February 24th. Now you can see that we are edging up above it on the other side. So again, that's telling you from a tactical, more actionable standpoint that if we can hold up above there, you can see the last time the green highlights upper left there in the lower panel from October to February 21st, when we moved above the monthly rate of change, that was a nice move higher. Um, it's trying to get there again. So that tells you that basically where we're at now is at the very least an inflection point, and we could be at a place where we're turning the corner from a tactical standpoint. You had talked about the overhead resistance in the S&P 500. I showed at 28.22 to 28.56. Those are the lows we made in August and October of last year, and we're kissing those levels right now. So that's um, – where we have to get through. If we fail there, this monthly rate of change is going to roll down, and that's going to tell you that the major downtrend, which we are in right now, is starting to resume. If we get through that area, this is kind of how you match a resistance level with an indicator, and that's how I see this. Mm. I love thinking, I love how you just described that, matching the, the resistance level with the indicator to see how what the characteristics of the move are leading up to a key level. Can I ask you, we just have a minute left, John, and I'd love to know, you know, I mentioned earlier about sector rotation, right? We have this situation today where like utilities, real estate are some of the better sectors, tech at the bottom of the list. How do you think about the sector rotation picture, and especially the leadership of technology 
relative to some of these levels? How does that relate to sort of the macro big picture that you're seeing? It's uh, interesting you say that. W one of the models we have here, it measures the um, percentage of assets moving in and out of the 10 main sector spiders, I call them, you know, the 10 that are the oldest that have, you know, the most data. Sure. And uh, last week we saw money moving into the utility sector, um, mm -hmm. which is a defensive play. I mean, that's generally speaking, that's how I would see it. And then uh, once a week, I go through every stock in the entire S&P 500 and just look at the chart, see if the chart's telling me anything. Are there any patterns there? Are we breaking a trend line? Kind of simple um, 32,000 feet stuff. And I saw a lot of utility stocks that look to be making bottoming type of patterns. They were breaking out of triangular type of patterns. So both from an asset flow standpoint and you know the construction of the chart the uh um the way the chart looks um the shape of the chart uh the patterns that i see on the chart it looks like uh um this move we've seen in utilities could have legs for a couple of weeks and what does that mean uh i think it's a defensive way to participate in this rally and uh without getting too far over your skis you know that's just speculation on on my part but that's how i would qualify that these are a couple of great charts and some and some great thoughts on the market john kozar thank you so much for joining us be safe and uh, we'll look forward to having you again on uh, very soon all right same here thank you that was uh, John Kosar from Asbury Research joining us from uh, the Chicago area. Just a, a fantastic analyst I've, I've enjoyed uh, getting to know uh, for a number of years. I've followed his work uh, when I was on the buy side and uh, great to continue to see what he's, uh, what he's thinking here. We need to wrap the show, folks, and go right to the three and three. So three charts in three minutes. As usual, the, my producer, Gretchen, in my ear is telling me it's about a minute and a half, which is pretty much par for the course when I host the show. So we're going to get through them one way or another. Chart number one, I thought this was a really cool ratio. Um, uh, this is actually a question I got uh, via Twitter and uh, it led me to create this chart looking at the ratio of the Qs versus the diamonds. So the NASDAQ versus the Dow. And uh, at the top, I'm showing that ratio of tech, uh, you know, in the form of the Qs versus the Dow in the form of the diamonds. And at the bottom, just a chart of the S&P. The question was, what do you make of the fact that uh, tech, you know, the Qs are underperforming, NASDAQ's underperforming the Dow? And, and my initial thought, as I'm creating the chart, I'm thinking, well, that can't be good if, you know, sort of tech, uh, broadly speaking, is underperforming. That seems a little rough. But what's funny is the, the cues, the NASDAQ had actually been outperforming the Dow going into the market top in February, and it actually continued to outperform going into the market bottom the third week in March. So that actually continued the whole way through. That's why the relative chart of the XLK has looked so good. But if you look at the last couple of weeks, that's where things have reversed. So since the market bottomed out, it's been other places you saw today, like financials, utilities, real estate at the top. Those are not, you know, NASDAQ tend to, tend to be NASDAQ companies that are leading the way there. And so that's why you're getting this reversal. So it doesn't concern me from a macro perspective, the fact that the NASDAQ is underperforming the Dow. I, I, I think, you know, you can see that the market can do well or poorly regardless of that. But I think it does speak to a potential rotation in leadership which is really compelling. On that theme, chart number two is looking at the ratio of consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. We've looked at this a number of times. At the top, this is cap weighted, so it's a heavyweight in Amazon in the numerator. On the bottom, we're looking at the equal weighted consumer discretionary, the equal weighted consumer staples. Here you can see that the ratio went down again into the market a uh, low sort of range. And then since then, it's really been sideways. So you have sort of this evening out relative strength wise, equal weighted between discretionary and staples, not saying offense or defense, it's sort of in digestion zone. So I think looking to see which way this ratio uh, resolves is actually gonna be kind of interesting. Chart number three is uh, the chart of financials, the XLF, as I mentioned, today it was one of the, it was the best sector out of the 11 that we follow. The relative strength breaking to a new you know month high, but Still a long way to go before I think it emerges as a relative winner, but you have to see the follow through in the price. I think one of the concerns with the XLF and other big, a lot of the bigger banks is that you've not sort of seen that resolution to the upside. We just got that today with a breakout, I think a follow through to the upside. And ladies and gentlemen, that's our show for today. We're gonna wrap the show and also wrap the week for a long holiday weekend. Thanks so much for sticking with us, participating in the final bar. Check out all of our previous episodes on our YouTube channel. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great long weekend, a great holiday. Bye now. 
Hey guys, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, if you did, give us a like down below, leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial minds. We'll see you back here very soon. Happy charting, my friends.